attimo il professor Provenzale, a questo punto chiamerei Dolores Catelan e Lorenzo Ricchiardi per la moderazione della terza e ultima sessione plenaria del 47 convegno. Prego. Buongiorno a tutti, buongiorno a tutti, allora abbiamo il piacere di inaugurare questa ultima sessione eh, che sarà in inglese, quindi adesso uh, uh, I will now shift to English as we have some uh, international speakers who have been invited for this last session of a, of a Congress and we are very honored of uh, chairing uh, uh, Dolores uh, and I this uh, this session we, which aims to explore discuss and maybe also understand uh, what is going on in uh, in, epi in epidemiology currently and also explore a bit the future directions in in research uh, in epidemiological research with a kind of uh, multidisciplinary approach uh, we have uh, four outstanding uh, speakers who are with us. Uh, two of them are with us here in the room, uh, Valentina Bollati and Klaus Ekstrom, while other two speakers, uh, Giuseppe Maria Anto and uh, Alessandro Vespignani, will be online, uh, hopefully. Uh, they are now trying to uh, establish the, the connection with them. And uh, the, the idea is to have uh, four the four presentations uh 15 uh, 15 minutes presentations and then leave the discussion at the end of the session and uh hopefully we'll be we will have time for the discussion and hopefully it will be a lively discussion uh, of course you can uh, ask questions both or comment the the presentations uh, both in italian or english as you wish uh of course english would be uh, simpler but otherwise you can also ask questions in italian and we will uh, uh, of course, interact with the speakers. Uh, this is all for the organizational issues, and then I leave the uh, uh, the floor to uh, Dolores, who will uh, start the session. Okay. So, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to me to, to introduce the first speaker, uh, which is also my friend, Valentina Bollati from the University of Milan. So Valentina is going uh, to talk about the internal exposome, what contribution to epidemiology. Okay. So thank you very much for the invitation. Um, so, internal exposome. If I ask you what are the determinants of health and disease, probably you, you will start with the genome, and then you would probably approach all the different layers that link the, the genome to their uh, manifestation of the genome. So you will talk about the transcriptome, the messenger RNAs, the proteome, so the developed protein, the metabolome, the microbiome, the epigenome, you probably would have in mind all these things that are inside the body. But then we all know that the determinants of, of disease are also outside the body. And we need to talk about the possible interaction between the outside world and the inside world. So we know very well that the internal exposome can strongly contribute to disease development, but how? how the complex exposome, which includes chemical exposure, behavioral factors, social factor, and so on, can be integrated, uh, evolving then in health preservation or disease development. What I think is that to manage such uh, an extreme number of variables, we need to define some intermediate biomarkers. These, bio these biomarkers might be considered like uh, 
biosensor, which are able to collect and translate uh, the triggers that are generated by the external world uh, and uh, with the final effect of modulating health and disease. And these biomarkers need to be modifiable by definition. So we cannot consider, for example, genomics. Genomics is another thing, it's not modifiable. Uh, so they can change in time and in response to a specific or to all the different exposure we experience. However, I'm not thinking to biomarkers that are directly linked to disease development. So they can change, but they are not a marker of disease. I will try to explain a little bit better what I mean. When we think about the processes that maintain uh, body healthy, uh, or rather they can cause disease, we usually have three main actors. We have the exposome, we observe many biological changes, and we do know that the exposure is associated with an increased risk of developing disease. So what we usually do uh, to combine these three concepts is uh, the exposome induces biological changes that are just prodromic to disease development. And we all tend to think like that probably, but this is not the only possibility. Biological changes can for sure be an intermediate mechanism linking the exposome to disease, but not all of them. We are all exposed to air pollutants. Some of us have a, have a bad diet uh, and an healthy lifestyle, but only a few individuals luckily then develop a disease. But everybody changes in response to the exposure. So some changes can only uh, represent a form of adaptation of our body. So we need to distinguish adaptive processes from pathogenetic changes. And if we make an analogy, we can think of the genome as a house acquired by a new owner, which is the exposome. So the new owner can adapt uh, the house according to his own needs. Uh, for example, some elements cannot be modified. Think for example, to the load bearing walls, they are there, they cannot be moved because they would cause instability to the house, but also to the genome. And uh, all the other elements can be modified according to the needs. And the changes that are reflecting the new owner needs are good. And they are a form of adaptation. So the largest part of the changes we experience in response to the exposome is good. We are adapting to the external environment and its challenges. However, some changes might occur in disagreement with the owner needs. And here in the, in the figure is the yellow room here. Oh, here. The, the yellow room is the unexpected, the unwanted, and here is where I believe that the disease, the disease occur. So when we measure any biomarker of disease and we want to find a link with the exposome, we need to keep in mind the additional challenge to distinguish between pathogenetic and adaptive changes. So how can we sort adaptive from misadaptive changes? I will now make two examples in which we use a completely new approach to look at the data. So the first example is based on the SPHERE study. Uh, SPHERE is a study established in 2011, thanks to an ERC starting grant. And with the study, we investigated whether exposure to air particles and all the PM associated metals can modify epigenetic and molecular markers, and whether these changes are associated with cardiovascular disease uh, development. So, the study population included uh, uh, 2,000 subjects with a BMI higher than 25, but otherwise healthy. So it's a population of healthy, overweight, or obese subjects. And one of the biomarkers we investigated in this, uh, in this study in a subset of, of the study subject is line one methylation. Line one is a repetitive element. So more than 90% of our DNA is non-coding and with the, uh, many repetitions. So for example, if we consider line one, we have approximately 300,000 copies in our, in our DNA. And if you are not really familiar with line one methylation, you can think to an armadillo. The armadillo is a very nice animal because uh, it uh, uh, has two opposite needs. So it needs to interact with the external environment uh, eat, move, mate, uh, needs to do things, but also to protect himself uh, whenever the external environment uh, is too tricky and requires it. Okay, so the open armadillo, the interacting armadillo, is a, a genome that is uh, hypomethylated in line one. And it has the interaction, but is also has a problem because, for example, the DNA, when it's open, in a, an open conformation, is, uh, um, can uh, break. 
when you have an external exposure. Okay, the plus, the abrupt armadillo is an hypermethylated uh, line one. The genome becomes very compact and stable. So you need to be able to switch from one status to the other to be healthy. Okay, in Sphere, we evaluated the effect of PN10 exposure on line one methylation. And what we observed here is, in, is an hypomethylation of line one for increasing uh, doses of PN10. It's a really standard uh, data because uh, it was replicated in many different population. Okay, well, the assumption everybody is doing here is that PM is bad for your health. So line one hypomethylation is bad as well because it gives you instability of the genome. So the subject that are experiencing more hypomethylation would have, would have an higher risk of developing diseases. I tried, I tried to look at in this way at this data. Yeah, recording they... in progress. Okay. What that? <laughs> okay. Uh, in this study, we were not able to find an association between line one methylation and health outcomes. But a little bit of shock for you because this is not the only way of looking at this data. What if? So what if? the effect we are measuring were the sum of the adaptive changes and pathogenetic changes. And what if we were able to distinguish among these two kinds of, uh, of changes? And this is what we try to do. I'm a little bit nervous to show you this data, but I will. Okay, so first uh, we evaluated the association between an environmental exposure, for example, uh, PN10 here, and an alteration in a given biological parameter, here is line one through a regression model, okay. Second, we estimated the predicted values of the biological of line one. So we have measure and predicted values of line one. And then we calculated the relative percent difference between the measured line one and the uh, predicted line one. And we calculated the, the relative percentage of change. So here, we have the same, exactly the same data, the same association between PM and line one, but I want to change the, the point of view. So what if the changes in line one that the subject experience are adaptive changes to the environmental trigger? If so, only those that are able to adapt to the trigger would modify their methylation in a proper way and would be healthy. So these subjects here are, uh, here, here, where is the mouse? The subject here, and here are the unexpected. They are in the yellow room of before. So red dots represent the subject showing observed value at least 5% lower than the estimated ones and does a negative percent, percent difference. And since the predicted values are somewhat representative of what we expect according to the biology, we could interpret such a PAD as a suggestive of individual inability to adapt to the trigger. On the contrary, the green dots are the subject overreacting. And we then evaluated the health status of these two groups of subjects and the subject with the red dots. So uh, insufficient reaction to the environmental tri trigger have a, almost a fourfold greater risk of developing metabolic syndrome in the next three years when compared to all the other subjects and also a ninefold higher risk of developing hypertension. I know the number are small, but still very strong. So what are the green dots? We don't know, but for example, as the literature reports that uh, hypermethylation of line one is linked to neurodegenerative diseases, maybe they have an higher risk of that, but the follow-up time is not long enough. So we need to, to wait for that. Now, completely different scenario, which is the inside study. And the original aim of the study was to investigate whether the exposure to particular can modify extracellular vesicle uh, released from maternal cell and placenta and to investigate whether these changes are linked to adverse pregnancy outcome. Inside is a, a study investigating uh, 518 pregnant, <clears throat> pregnant women that were recruited at the 12th week of gestational age, all healthy at, bas at baseline, but then some of them developed adverse pregnancy outcomes. So, for those of you that are not familiar with extracellular vesicle, they are small structure uh, limited by a lipid bilayer that can be generated by any cell. They travel in uh, biological fluids and they uh, 
are a sort of communication among different tissues and cell. So they are the speech of the cell. They are highly modulated by external inputs and by the internal environment. They can contain, for example, messenger RNAs, microRNA, and they can travel, reach other cell and modulate the fate of other cells that are far from uh, the cell that release this, uh, this structure. They have a very important role in pregnancy because the placenta is able to modify uh, the functioning of all the other cells across the maternal body uh, in order to uh, allow the adaptation to the mm, develop development of the fetus. In particular, there are vesicles that are carrying, uh, I know it's difficult, but they have a virus on the membrane. It's a, a human endogenous retrovirus. So it means that it's the result of an ancestral infection. And these, sequence, these sequences were maintained in the genome and they are like viruses. So they are inside us, but they maintain some properties of the viral world. So for example, this protein maintains uh, uh, lytic properties. When it's act activated, uh, it drives uh, the formation of the syncytia trophoblast of the placenta. And after that, the vesicles that are carrying uh, this particular sequence uh, are able to train the maternal immune system to make it, uh, to allow the, the um, um, development of the, of the baby. Okay, we know that uh, her positive extracellular vesicles are present in pregnancy in a very large uh, number, but they are also present uh, in normal life and uh, they are highly stimulated by external inputs. So we uh, showed, for example, they are upregulated uh, uh, when there is an increase, uh, an increase uh, level of air pollutants, uh, smoking, viral infection, physical activity. It seems that they are there to interact with the external environment. Same idea as before. Uh, we observed that PM10 level experienced by the mother on the day preceding the blood drawing were associated with the herb positive EVs. And once again, there is no association with the adverse pregnancy outcomes. But what if? Even in this case, we define the women with an exaggerated reaction to the environmental noxine green and women with a low reaction in the lower part in red. And the women with uh, the percent difference higher, the, the green one, had a six-fold greater risk of developing gestational diabetes before the end of the pregnancy. And moreover, even if we consider a simpler way of looking at the data, if we consider the residual of the model as a continuous variable, we observed that a continuous significant association between the increasing of residual and the value of maternal diastolic blood pressure. The exposome shapes the individual epigenetic pattern, the molecular pattern and the internal exposome, this is for sure. But each of us has an intrinsic adaptive capacity that allows to react to continuous stimuli from the environment. And however, in some context or with some particular pattern of genetics, we can lower this adaptive capacity, we can lose it. And the concept of adaptive capacity and the loss of adaptive capacity is linked to disease risk. If we change and adapt to the external stimuli, we remain in a healthy condition. If we don't change, we get a disease. And maybe this is the key for a change of perspective in considering diseases and in particular environmentally determined diseases. This is what I think at least. I need to thank the ERC, not only for the SPHERE study, but also for the Mameli study that was financed a couple of months ago. And we are going to start with this new big project, uh, I think in November, and we will apply this new approach to a large population of subjects. We are planning to recruit uh, 6,200 subjects uh, and uh, to study the exposome. And also thanks to the INSIDE consortium and all the colleagues at the University of Milan, in particular, Michele Carugno, who developed this uh, crazy hypothesis with me, and uh, Michele Miragoli from University of Parma and Andrea Cattano from the University of uh, Insubria. And this is my group, my lab, and thank you all for your patience. Thank you a lot. Thank you a lot, Valentina. Uh, if uh, you have any questions, uh, wait wait for the end uh, of this, of uh, 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 lectures. Uh, of course, uh, as expected, uh, we have uh, connection problems. Uh, 
so we will have a change in the program and I would like to invite Klaus Ekstrom to the to the podium to, to speak. Um, no, 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 okay, sorry, sorry, Klaus. <laughs> okay, so we, we will keep the uh, alternation of uh, one in presence and one online presentation. So we still have a change in the program. Instead of Joseph Anto, uh, we now uh, uh, will be um, uh, Alessandro, Professor Alessandro Vespignani, who will speak, who will give a talk on uh, uh, the future of infectious disease control, forecasting scenario analysis and policy making uh, from Alessandro Vespignani, Northeastern University, which uh, we can see. Hello, and um, thank you. He, uh, Alessandro Spignani is uh, connected from the US, so it's very early in the morning. So thank you a lot for having joined us and sorry for the change in the program. So it's still, it's even earlier than, uh, than uh, it was supposed to be uh, your talk in the morning. So thank you a lot and uh, the, the floor is, is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh... Uh, for the chance to address uh, this audience. And uh, uh, I think I could move into the slides and I have to ask uh, the uh, organization to show my slide yeah. that I don't... They're going to do it now. Just... Okay, good, thank you. Okay. So... Perfect. Perfect. So I would go into the next slide since my title has been uh, uh, kindly already announced. And I will try to give you an introduction to uh, what is, uh, how to say, with my two cents on the, on the uh, perspective on, on the forecasting uh, of uh, infectious diseases. Uh, um, I see there are a few technical problems, but you know because the the the, the slides background is not the correct one. But hopefully the next uh, yeah, okay. So I wanted uh, that that was a slide of uh, that was acknowledging the fact that the work I will show you it's uh, it's actually not just uh, just me, but my team at Northeastern University with with a number of researchers, but as well collaborations across. Uh, uh, several uh, several institutions, uh, including uh, of strict collaboration with the Center for Disease Control in the U.S., uh, the WHO, and many other partners that have shaped in the last three years uh, the the area. So when we think about uh, uh, public health, we for sure we we need to realize that uh, public health will be the battlefield uh, probably of the major crisis in the next uh, few years, from uh, rising inequality to you know, and we have already went through one uh, uh, epidemic and infectious disease uh, threats, migration, biodiversity loss, uh, climate change. Uh, and as well, there is something looming on top of all that, uh, that is the, 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 the misinformation and the polarization that is occurring every time we are challenged by those problems. So the issue, however, is can we use a novel uh, tools and novel approaches with respect to what we were using, and especially can we take advantage of uh, uh, digital technologies, computational approaches, um, and ultimately, can we achieve that kind of forecasting and uh, analytics that in other area we, we use and along with the ever increasing, ever increasing power of artificial intelligence. And, and here is, uh, you know, I think the past years have shown quite, uh, quite eloquently that, uh, you know, we are in, uh, in, uh, in, in at, at, a, at a point in which we can finally really envision forecasting and scenario analysis in a way that is, uh, that is unprecedented in, in the area of uh, epidemiology, but as well, I, I, and, and most specifically, what, what I will tackle is the uh, is the areas of infectious disease analysis, and I will uh, uh, obviously the pandemic. So, it, but are we really, you know? And here there is a lot of con probably of uh, uh, if you go on the media, if you go in the in the public perception, as well as in the practitioner like us. So there is a question: uh, that, that Are we able to do uh, infectious disease forecast, for instance? So if we go to the next slide, I just took. Uh, 
the, the liberty to uh, ask um, ChatGPT, ChatGPT, so an artificial intelligence algorithm, what it does think about it. And yes, uh, if basically going through 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 the mainstream uh, uh, information that uh, the platform approaches, yes, infectious disease is a reality. The problem is, uh, okay, uh, what are the limits? What what does it mean really to to to, to do infectious disease uh, uh, forecast uh, in uh, in in infectious diseases? So. Uh, let's move to the next slide and uh, and tell you know uh, that basically doing uh, infectious disease uh, forecast means to have actionable uh, modeling for policy making so to get information that anticipate the 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 the, the, the how to say the trajectory of an infectious disease threat in a way that we can uh device policy making we can devise intervention mitigation policies and 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 so on and so forth so in that sense uh, i would uh, I, I want to be very careful and i don't want to uh, to discuss the the area like uh, you know well there is just artificial intelligence and and uh, new approaches actually what we have to do is to combine uh, the best of all worlds that we have in uh, in uh, in the area so uh, the main issue is to go from something that is perhaps uh, similar to 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 the the classic uh, time uh, uh, series that, that that we have to uh, to a place in which we are closer to what where we are for instance with with weather forecast when when we uh, can project through space and time in a in a meaningful way the trajectory of a hurricane in this process uh, we need to 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 basically throw all our weapons at, at, uh, at the problem. But, uh, you know, we have to keep in mind that in this area, especially infectious disease, disease uh, policy making, we need to have interpretability. We can use uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence, but we obviously need to combine this with understanding from mechanistic approach, from a generative approach that allow us to uh, understand the mechanism of a disease uh, uh, spreading. We don't just want to know how many cases we will have tomorrow, but why we will have that many cases, why uh, the, the, the vaccine uh, is working or not, or how much it is working in the population, and, and, and what are the, the, the key determinants of the spreading of a disease. And that means to, 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 to work uh, in, in these approaches through uh, effective equations through through an understanding of of uh, of the, the 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 statistic and mathematics that is behind our our uh, our forecast as well as we need uh, those, all the, those elements because we want to have a clear uh, grip on uh, on what is the effect of our partial knowledge of in, uh, initial conditions, what are our prediction limits, and what what is basically that we can uh, we can say and with what confidence interval in a reliable way. So if we go to the next slide, uh, let me do something and 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 something that is important, you know, because generally when we talk about uh, computational modeling and analytics, uh, we just think about uh, forecast. But actually, as you know, uh, modeling is much more than forecast. Computational modeling is much more than forecast. It's situational awareness. So it means that it allows us to understand what is the situation on the ground at the moment that we don't have enough data or we have very uh, a lot of opacity and what we call the fog of war there is a lot of that is based uh, that, a lot of work that uh, that, that, that to say that uh, exploit projections and intervention planning so the use of, of, of modeling as a way to to perform structured reasoning, that include also all the counterfactuals and uh, and uh, uh, causal inference that you can imagine, as well as there is an important component of all these modeling uh, uh, approaches that is the disease characterization, characterization itself. 
go to the next slide, if we look at uh, what kind of uh, approaches we have at the moment, uh, uh, well, uh, they have been, uh, in the last 10 years, they have completely changed with, with respect to the, how to say, the classic textbook uh, perspective of, uh, of uh, classic uh, susceptible uh, infected recovery model. What we use now are multi-scale frameworks in which we have several layers that uh, represent the population at very fine geographical scale, include commuting patterns uh, at different uh, geographical scales, and as well introduce movement uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, human mobility also at the international uh, scale, it integrates the entire airline traffic, the origin destination traffic across the world, and so on and so forth. It's in all that there is not just uh, human mobility and, and, and census data, there is, there is much more than that. There is infrastructural capability, logistics, uh, hospital, uh, hospital capacity, and so on and so forth. That is all integrated in the modeling that can work at different geographical resolution from the worldwide level down to the specific of a single urban area. In doing that, uh, we need to understand that the kind of approach is not uh, uh, one model fits all, but is tailored uh, uh, to the scale of the problem and the questions we are asking to the modeling and, and the forecast. Uh, we can use, at a, for instance, at a global scale, more coarse grain model like metapopulation approaches or that are more, uh, how to say, that do not distinguish the feature of uh, each individual down to the level of uh, what we call the multiplex uh, network representation in which each layer of, of a specific network uh, represent a, a, a disease a transmission setting like the household, the school, work, the school place, uh, the workplace, uh, the general community. And then all those layers are connected also through different, uh, through different uh, uh, level of, uh, of, of contacts. So those contacts are now generated through uh, a combination of uh, uh, both uh, census data and, uh, and data collection on the field, but also through, and if we go to the next, uh, to the next slide, uh, this is also even more clear, through uh, novel technology, so through, uh, through devices uh, and uh, and um, through the mobile devices and other sensors that we can deploy in the environment can we go to the next slide please uh, this uh, uh, this kind of data are really working at this point at a kind of completely unprecedented uh, uh, level because they allow us to uh, look at uh, single individual contacts, uh, not just in specific setting, but also in a longitudinal way in time. And so we can really map uh, both contacts, collocation, presence, uh, human mobility, distance of mobility of individuals uh, at for millions of individuals at once. And those data can in, be integrated in, in, in the modeling in real time. So that means to start grasp, grasping what is the behavior of, uh, of individuals, try to develop at least an outcasting or simple uh, uh, forecasting approach, also behavior and mobility of, uh, of individuals, getting to a complete new, I would say, uh, um, tomography of the of the uh, uh, and stru of the structure of, of the society that is underlying and carrying the spreading of the disease. If we go to the next slide, and uh, I, I just want to show you an example of data collected in the Boston area. This is uh, uh, data that are uh, representing uh, uh, the human mobility in terms of uh, presence of people at the census district uh, level. Please, the next slide. Yeah, and then if you click, the slides should animate itself, uh, please. Uh, now, clicking on the slide from the, uh, if the... È possibile cliccare sulla, sulla slide? Yes, if just, just uh, like, if you just I, like, go I'm to the next slide. The tec technical uh, people, whether they can do that or not. If they just have to move, uh, it's like if they go to the next slide, but, and then the slide should start uh, uh, to animate. No. 
So, okay. So, unfortunately, this is a technical uh, uh, issue. Um, so, th this was an example just to show you that it's possible to have very uh, detailed information on, on, on the total contacts of individuals, the distinct contacts of individuals, the mobility range, the commute volume. And this was at the level of census tract in Boston. And, and what I, uh, the, the figures was meant to show you is how what was the the average baseline before uh, the pandemic and how those uh, metrics were affected during the pandemic in the following uh, in the following months so we can just move then to the next slide and uh, and let me uh, discuss another uh, important issue because this is uh, when we have uh, uh, when we have those those forecasts, we can integrate all those data. But uh, you know we have to be uh, very uh, uh, adamant on the fact that uh, you know there are a lot of uncertainties. And one of the problem that we have for uh, for infectious disease uh, disease forecasts and, and 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 analysis is the fact that we need to. Uh, to calibrate the data, and why generally, if we think about uh, uh, about uh, weather forecast, uh, we have uncertainty on the initial conditions. So the data at this point are quite uh, accurate. For infectious disease forecast, we have uh, uh, a lot of opacity on the initial conditions. Uh, we have parameter uncertainties and priors uh, on. Uh, uh, on many quantities characterizing the disease, as well as we have several possible modeling assumptions underlying the description of, of, uh, of the disease spreading. And so what we have is that uh, along with the stochasticity of the model that are, is always uh, uh, in, uh, in the game, we generate uh, and we have to generate millions of possible trajectory and calibrate those trajectory, for instance, in our large computational approaches, this is done through approximate Bayesian computation, although there are, you know, MCMC technique uh, uh, and, and, and many other possible uh, routes for that. But, you know, there is something that, that is making different, uh, the, the situation quite different from weather forecast is that we have uncertainties, not just on the future, but in a sense, we have uncertainty. But actually, the models are calibrated in a way that there is uncertainty also with respect to the past, and so that's something that we have always to uh, to, to keep in mind when then we will start uh, we start to project into into uh, into the future. Uh, next slide, please. The main these uh, things that also we need to to uh, to to make it clear in the area of uh, of infectious diseases uh, is that uh, we have to distinguish clearly between what we call forecast and what we call projections forecast uh, as in many other areas are uh, based on the best knowledge that we have on the ground and the immediate future that we can uh, we we know in terms of policy and interventions and they have uh, to our uh, experience in the last few years a time horizon that doesn't go beyond four weeks up to four weeks already the uh, the forecast tend to be uh, quite uh, uh, quite noisy noisy in terms of uh, uh, with, with with how to say with a large uncertainty when we uh, and this has happened a lot during the the, the covid 19 pandemic we start to project on a, lo a longer time horizon like uh, two three, four months, then we entered the territory of projections. That is a completely different story. These are, uh, how to say, conditional, uh, our modeling uh, of the future, conditional to specific assumption that we do on population behavior, uh, non-pharmaceuticals -pharmaceutic and pharmaceuticals interventions, uh, um, and also possible change in, in, uh, in the pathogen like we have seen with many variants. And so this is a just scenario that doesn't have to be uh, considered as, as, as forecast, but just a, a kind if we, and if we go to next slide, uh, that is even more clear, uh, as possible map of the future. 
So uh, here we show, I show a, uh, an example of uh, two long-term scenarios that we, 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 we did with the scenario modeling gap uh, uh, that is coordinated by the Center for Disease Control. And when I, uh, you see here optimistic or pessimistic, doesn't mean optimistic or pessimistic with respect to the modeler perspective, but actually to certain uh, assumption on the uptake of vaccine in the US, uh, in the US population. And so you see that uh, basically what we can expect for, for, a scenario, for scenarios is at the most to envelop what will be the future. And they are not providing exact forecast. They generate map of the future that are reasoning tools that they can be useful to generate risk assessment, policy design, but cannot use, no future will be uh, represented exactly by any one of the scenarios. If we go to the next slide, uh, however, there is another major point that I, that I want to stress in this area. It is the fact that, you know, if we have so many possible uh, uh, assumptions and uncertainties that will be implemented in model in a different way, we need to think that, uh, you know, uh, models are not oracles. So each model might have different and provide different uh, uh, both forecast and map of the future. This is not uh, uh, something actually different from other areas. So if we go to the next slide, uh, uh, hopefully, there is, uh, uh, yeah, here too, there is no animation. Um, <clears throat> Unfortunately, uh, there was, uh, uh, I was showing how also for Hurricane, uh, we work with several models that then are ensembled to generate a specific uncertainty cone for the evolution of, uh, of the epidemic. While the same, and it's the same of what we do in, in model forecasting for infectious diseases, where we just combine different different models to generate ensemble ensemble uh, ensemble forecast that envelop the actual signal, and this is done both for 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 the forecast and both for the scenario in order to avoid the problem of relying on a single model. This is, seems a technical issue, but it's not just a technical issue. Ensemble math, in a way, what we do in ensembling the forecasting is also means ensemble communications. We communicate, not going to individuals, uh, uh, teams or perspective, but creating what are uh, national center for, uh, for forecasting that provide consensus and, uh, uh, and unique communication of what will be the future and risk assessment. Uh, next slide. This is what, uh, as an example, you can find for uh, 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 the work done by several of us in the United States, both with uh, ensemble uh, COVID-19 forecast approach uh, that was producing both hospital and deaths uh, uh, forecast up to four weeks time horizon, and those was forecast and more. Uh, instead, the work in planning scenarios uh, um, that has been done by the Scenario Modeling Hub, uh, where uh, that it, it has been used to, to, to define several policies uh, with respect to, uh, to child vac uh, vaccination, the risk uh, during the emergence of variants, uh, and, uh, and uh, other, uh, other uh, uh, and 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 uh, vaccination campaigns. Next slide. I don't. I I I just see that my time is uh, is well over. So I'm I'm sorry, uh, but communicating uh, this way it's not easy. Uh, so did the community deliver? If we think about the pandemic, yes, the modeling and the intelligence community, epidemiological intelligence community, did a lot of work, especially in the early stage of the pandemic, from understanding the epidemic in China to providing. Uh, early estimates of the disease characterization, early estimates of, uh, of the global spreading and dispersal. Uh, well, forecasting. Forecasting is good, bad and ugly, because we have to be honest, we are not yet at the stage of, of weather forecasting. But if you think about the ensemble forecast, for instance, produced by the CDC, they are overall 40% better than, than baseline, which are basic forecast uh, uh, done on the assumption that in the next uh, in the next future you uh, in, the in the near future you will see what has been in the near past and uh, and it has been used to do a lot of important uh, decision making about vaccination the, the, the risk of resurgence due to variants etc uh, etc et 
And here I want to close for this audience, if we go to the next slide, with a simple weather example. Because when we talk about uh, uh, weather forecast, it's not just a matter of data, but also what data. So for instance, in epidemic forecast, when we try to forecast the flu season, uh, we the target is to forecast the flu incidence. So how many cases of flu we will have in the next few weeks. But actually what we are forecasting in many cases is what we call ILI rate. And this is a sample of this ILI rate. So influenza-like illnesses in the population detected through uh, an, a sentinel network of doctors. Well, if you want to translate that in the weather forecast, it's like having as a target uh, the forecast of the temperature, but then, to use to forecast temperature and as a target, actually the variation of energy bill from households. So something that is completely different is not a real snapshot of what, what is happening on the ground for the flu, but a probe, a proxy, that is uh, you know, what happens uh, <laughs> with some other, other quantity that is related to, to the flu incidence in a way that the weather is not completely transparent. And so you see, and if we go to the next slide, if really the community think that forecasting uh, uh, in public health is necessary and in demand, as we have seen during the pandemic, then we need massive investment in data collection that has to be driven also by the forecasting community. Because this is really, we need specific data and in a collected in a way that has to be agreed upon in order that those tools are projected into a future where they can be more effective. Thank you very much for your attention. And I truly apologize for the I apologize for the technical difficulties with the slide. No problem. Um, okay, so we move to the third speaker, which is an in-person speaker. So uh, Klaus Ekstrom from uh, the Copenhagen University and uh, is going to talk about artificial intelligence and causal inference. very much. Let, let me just start. Okay. Uh, so thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. And I will be talking uh, a bit about AI. And it seems that these days that everyone is talking about, about AI and artificial intelligence. So uh, I, I'd like to give some perspectives on how it could play into the way we do epidemiology and also on possibly future research ideas in, in statistics and, and epidemiology. So, so AI is, is here. I mean, everyone is talking about ChatGPT and how we can produce new images and what the future, what the future will bring. And the thing is that when, when people are talking about AI, they are thinking something about uh, robots that can save us in some dire situation. They, they can run and they can think and they can do all the right things. And, and I, I guess that's not really where we are and, and possibly quite quite a bit away from where we are uh, right now. But that's that's the, 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 the big dream about what AI can do for us. So, so let me try to give uh, three examples of areas where AI in the very near future with the AI that we have available right now could play into how we do research in epidemiology. And the first and the first overall issue that I will talk about is in is in causal guidance. So if if we want to say something about the, the causal interpretation of what how how a system works, how things play together, we often need to to make a proposal about how the world works, like a, a, a directed acyclic graph, a DAC. And in order to have a DAC for a specific problem, we need to have some field experts who know something about this particular area. So what are the relevant uh, variables that we should include? What are the possible confounders? What are the possible selection biases that could occur in this situation? And what are the types of data that we should have available if we want to make a causal statement 
about a relationship between two, two uh, things. So rain and um, uh, seeing people with umbrellas, can we, can we make a causal statement about that? And, and to make a graph like this that drives the research and the estimation and all of that, we need someone who knows some, something about the particular field, someone with knowledge. And if you, if you really want to see something that is slightly scary the first couple of times that you see it, then bring a couple of researchers together from any field and ask them uh, what are the important variables and write your individual DAX and see whether or not they agree on what the variables are and the DAX should be. They don't. So even though they might be working uh, door to door um, and, and have been collaborators, they have different opinions about how the world works. So, so that, is, that is why it's necessary to have inputs from several sources in order to make these DAX. And, and that is science, having people discussing what is relevant, why do you think like that? Why do I think like that? And can we come up with a consensus graph? And in those situations, we have an extra player chat GPT, and we've already seen an example in, in Alessandro's talk. So for example, I, I used chat GPT and it's illegal in Italy, I think. So I, I used it back home, let me say that. Uh, um, so uh, let, let's say I would want to figure out what was the causal relationship between smoking and, and lung capacity. So that's my research aim. So I could write it a question like this and, and want uh, chat GPT to, to to provide extra information because there might be something out there that I didn't know about and I'm only talking to a certain set of researchers and they may also not know some know everything that's going on there might be confirmation bias in my sources and what it produces is a list like what you can see here and it uh, may or may not be readable but it actually makes sense some of the variables that it says that we should include we should include age because lung capacity increases with age, we should maybe consider having uh, information about physical activity because that might also be a possible confounder with people being more physical active, being less likely to smoke, but also having a different size of the, uh, the lung capacity. So having this as an extra player is an AI option that is already available when we want to make a graph uh, for, a, for a DAG in order to be um, able to do causal causal inference and, and causal reasoning in a specific situation. And it will only get better in the next couple of, of years. And we will quite likely in the very near future have an AI like ChatGPT that is trained not on tons of text, but on specific research papers. And, and it's all, so some of the initial prototypes are already there. And we will be able to hone more closely in on what could be relevant in a, in a given field and, and help us out with things that we haven't considered. Item two, where AI could play an issue, is estimating causal inference. So let's assume that we have a DAG and we would like to make a statement about a, a causal effect of a certain treatment. So what we normally do is that we try to estimate the uh, expectation or the, uh, the, uh, the, the forecast of a given uh, um, a condition or disease Y based on the treatment that is A in this case here and a set of, of possible variables that is X. And, and typically we do that by having some mathematical function of, with, a, with a known functional shape or form F and that uh, drives the relationship or the type of relationship between Y or the, the outcome and the treatment and the X. But why, why do we need to decide on F? Why do we as investigators need to specify what that shape should be? Maybe we should just have some AI model saying the best shape to actually model this would be whatever the AI um, uh, mechanism or model comes up with. And if we have that, then we're able to estimate uh, things that we as statisticians or epidemiologists are really searching for in many cases something like the average treatment effect. So we would be able to compute the expected uh, outcome for people who are treated, and we would be able to compute the expected outcome for people who are not treated if we did an intervention, intervention and we could, could compare the differences between those two. And we know the estimator for that one. So if we have an AI model, we can actually just use that estimator right away because we can run this fairly simple AI based algorithm that resembles the G formula if you want to take into account specific confounders. So we, we can estimate the prediction using our AI tool, whatever that is. 
and or in an ensemble of AI tools, not just a single one, but a collection of, of, of uh, models or tools. And then we can use that specific ensemble model to make predictions, what would the outcome be for a certain set of variables X? And if we set the treatment to be occurring or we set the treatment to not be occurring, and then we're able to make a, a rather simple estimation of the average treatment effect. So if we can uh, focus our research on, on uh, having AI generated models that would describe a reasonable relationship between our variables in the model and the outcome without us having to decide it upfront, then we're able to possibly improve the estimation of these average treatment effects. And of course, we still need all the assumptions that are necessary in order to make these causal statements or causal conclusions in the end, but the model would work even, even um, uh, if we didn't have to specify it up front as we are used to doing. Right, so the uh, third area where I think that AI could have an influence on the research that we're doing in the very near future is on causal discovery or, or structure learning. So in many cases, we propose a DAG, we already have an idea about what the relationship between some of the variables might be and what the confounders could be or the mediators. But why, why should we focus on what we already know? If we only do that, we are essentially doing a, a bit of confirmation analysis because we might not be as open to new ideas as, uh, as, as we should because we already have preconceived ideas about how the world is working. So one way is try to use a data-driven approach in order to try to infer the DAC from the data. So in this case here, there are four variables, X, A, M, and Y, and we have measured those on a set of individuals, and we would like to figure out what's the relationship between those four variables. Can we actually, based on the data, uh, derive possibly the, the whole DAC, but maybe just some of the DAC, and then we can discuss the remaining, uh, the remaining parts of the DAC. So there is an algorithm already, the PC algorithm, and, and the reference is here by, uh, by uh, um, Spurdis and Glimmer, and, and that can actually identify the conditional independencies based on data in a graph. It, it doesn't produce a DAG, it produces a, a CP DAG, which, which is a, a superclass of, of DAGs. But in some cases, it's able to determine where do we have edges between these, we, between these variables, and also what if if the edges we if we can point in a direction is it the causal uh, in, influence from one variable to the other or from the other variable to the first that the PC algorithm can can produce a um, a, a class uh, of of results that that plays into uh, that plays into this. So it works and they, we've been, it's, it's been able to be shown mathematically that it will produce the right result if we have infinitely many data. And that is a situation or a world that we don't really live in. Uh, and and uh, so we, we need to work our research in this world, in the real world, and where we don't have infinitely many data. So what do we do in those cases? Because the all of the nice properties, they work only in the limit. So what we need to do in order to make the PC algorithm work is to essentially try to consider all types of possible sets of variables to condition on. So imagine that I'm really interested in order to determine is there a link or a potential relationship between the two variables A and Y. So that's that's my, my main purpose here. So the the, the way we determine whether or not there's a link or an edge between those two variables is that whatever possible variables, other variables that we could condition on, if we end up being able to have this link in any case, then we would say that there's an, uh, there's an edge. If we can find a subset where the edge disappears, if we condition on that subset, then we have a conditional independence. So we need to consider all possible subsets so we could see whether or not A and Y are just marginally independent, or if they're independent given X, if they're independent given M, if they're independent given X and M. And in each of those cases, of course, if I have a large number of variables, I need to have a large number of sets to consider. But in each number of these cases, I would need to have a model that can do the test for conditional independence. 
And that depends on the variable type and the distribution and all of those other matters. And we don't have the time and resources to specify each of those models individually, because there might be 100,000 models of conditional independencies that we would need to consider. And in this case here, we won't be able to specify all of them. So we would need to have an AI algorithm that could propose what the best model would be in order to determine whether or not there's a conditional independence between two specific variables given another set. And this is where there could be a lot of research in the very near future that could help us out. So these are three areas, guidance and inference and structure learning, where I think that the AI that we have available or just about to have available will be able to help us in our future research. And I've just said we can just use the AI and that's that's free for me to say because it's not simple to actually have how we should use it and, and when it will work and when it won't work. But this is where we should focus our attention in research in the next coming years, I think. So let me finish off with a um, small quote here. In order for AI to work, artificial intelligence, it only works if we also have intelligence. So it doesn't really matter that much whether or not AI will be here in the future. I don't think we should be worried about it taking our jobs. It will make them more interesting and more efficient and may, maybe more optimized, but we still need human beings to actually consider what is reasonable and what is not reasonable. And there are tons of situations where pictures are being produced of hands with six fingers or 10 fingers or two noses or the chat GPT is really not able to do anything to, to do with numbers. So we need human intelligence in order for this to work in the future as well. And that was it. Thank you. Thank you a lot, Klaus. Another great uh, presentation. Uh, we, we got really a lot of uh, uh, information uh, to uh, use our intelligence upon. So thank you. Thank you a lot. And uh, we can uh, uh, now move to the last uh, uh, lecture before uh, starting the discussion. And the uh, uh, last speaker is uh, Joseph Mariento from the ICE Global who is connected online, hopefully. And uh, he will uh, 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 talk about the, the uh, uh, epidemiology of the future, adapting the population-based approach to the challenges of uh, Anthropocene. So we will have a kind of a broad uh, picture here. I can, I can see you, Joseph Maria. So thank you for joining and uh, the, the floor is yours. Buongiorno, Lorenzo. Can, can you hear me well? Yes, yes, it is working. Okay. So, grazie tante per l'invitazione a partecipare a questo congresso. È una, un grande piacere di essere qui. Mi, avere, eh, mi sarebbe piaciuto molto di essere con voi a Pisa, ma uh, purtroppo non è stato possibile. So, grazie mille per l'opportunità di partecipare a distanza. Uh, can we have the first slide, please? I cannot. Okay. So as uh, Lorenzo was saying, I, I will give an overall picture of uh, what are the challenges for epidemiology in the present and in the future context of the Anthropocene. And I will start with uh, the, the next slide. Uh, suggesting that the two key words to uh, think about the challenges that we face are uh, the Anthropocene and the urgency. And all you are familiar with the growing science of the Anthropocene. And here you have two emblematic papers in 2015 and 16 in science. And uh, these papers uh, put to, for the white scientific audience, uh, the evidence that we are in a, a context in which we can probably not longer talk about the Holocene as this 2,000, uh, uh, 10,000 years uh, period of ter thermal stability, uh, 
uh, at, in the contrast, we are moving in an uncharted uh, territory that we call the Anthropocene, where most of the natural systems are uh, evolving to unstable conditions and disrupted behaviors that are uh, difficult even to, to understand and predict. And uh, I think that the concept of planetary boundaries is very consequential in the sense that for a number of these systems, including the two core systems, the climate and the and the biodiversity, together with the biochemical flows and the and the land, uh, we are having grow evidence that we are moving beyond the stability areas within this graph of the paper, as depicted in green, to areas of instability in yellow, and uh, growingly to areas where changes can be irreversible and we can be at high risk of cascades of catastrophic tipping points. Uh, the evidence is growing for all these areas, uh, including also obviously the fresh water and the ocean uh, waters. Uh, and there is more and more evidence of the parameters that allow to characterize these planetary boundaries. And there are even some new concepts like this planetary boundary of novel entities where you can put together most of the uh, chemicals and new materials and pollutants that we have been concerned for uh, during many years in epidemiology and in environmental epidemiology. And just to remind you, for those of you that have not seen it, that it's a very, very nice uh, for the white audience uh, Netflix documentary, Breaking Boundaries, uh, where you can see a wonderful synthesis of the recent science in this field. And I say that there are two ideas that are key. One is the Anthropocene and the other one is the urgency, because uh, as you very well know, for many of these planetary boundaries, including obviously the climate, we have uh, growing evidence that we have a limited number of years to mitigate the impacts in a way that we can, we are not fully in this red area of catastrophic uh, tipping cascades. So this is basically uh, well, well exemplified by the 2018 International Panel of Climate Change Committee, uh, famous report of 1.5 degrees saying uh, to avoid the catastrophic scenario of two degrees or beyond two degrees, as agreed in the Paris Agreement, we need to halve the emissions of CO2 equivalent uh, gases for 2030 and be carbon neutral uh, for 2050. And this uh, qualifies this concept of urgency. So can we have the next slide, please? In this context of Anthropocene and urgency, well, this work art of Isaac Cordal, which is a multimedia uh, artist in the northwest of uh, Spain, in this series, Follow of the Leaders, I mean, it's an invitation to ask ourselves, how should epidemiology respond to the uh, Anthropocene-related crisis uh, and its urgency? And this is a, obviously a complex question. It may have as many views as people in the room, probably. But to my, to, in, my, in my personal view, uh, the answer to this question came uh, with reading a paper, as it happens sometimes in science. So can we have the next slide, please? This paper was a paper published in 2015 in Lancet. The title was Safeguarding Human Health in the Anthropocene Epoch. And uh, after the starting to read the paper, it's a very long paper with hundreds of citations, I think very robust elaboration. But after the starting to read the paper, I soon had the impression that the paper was going to change my way of thinking about public health and epidemiology. And this was probably uh, because the paper starts with a paradox. And the paradox is how we can explain in a clear way that during the last 50 years, which is the period where probably global health, despite inequalities, has been improving the most, has coincided with 
this period in which the health of the planet has been deteriorated the most? And there are no uh, simple answers for this question, but the, the, the Rockefeller Lancet Committee, uh, they say, uh, well, the problem is that our current concept of health does not take into account whether the health gains are achieved at the cost of eroding the Earth's underpinning natural systems. And then they provide a definition of planetary health. Basically, what they say in this definition of planetary health is that human health and the health of the planet should go together. And that in the context of the Anthropocene and its urgencies, there will be no gains in human health if there are no in parallel gains for the health of the planet. And what I want to do in the next slides is elaborate which are some of the, to my view, the consequences uh, of this approach of planetary health for epidemiology. And to do that, I will use these uh, three types of uh, uh, challenges that are uh, elaborated in the Lancet paper that you saw in the last email, challenges to imagination, challenges in knowledge and challenges implementation. And in doing that, I will try, or I have tried not to think that we as humans now are, we have the opportunity to restore the health of the planet, but rather think in the other way, in the, in the different direction, that is the planet with its changes that have been produced by this uh, type of uncontrolled human activity, what is giving us as humans the opportunity to understand better ourselves, and in this case, ourselves as epidemiologists and our tools in epidemiology. So I will start uh, with one slide for the challenges of imagination. And I think this is the next slide, please. Uh, this is an invitation to think about the way we think about our health and the human health. And the first implication for epidemiology, I think from the planetary health approach, is that if we uh, really understand the, uh, what is happening at the planet level and which the consequences will be for the humanity, then my belief is that epidemiology should care about the health of the planet as much as currently we care about the health of humans. Well, and this is a break with the typical or the, I mean, with the, our uh, main paradigm where we see the environment as a set of risk factors and preventive factors for human health. And here we want to see health, I mean, vis-a-vis uh, -vis with the health of the planet and interrelated uh, in complex ways. And one consequence of this is that, in my view, epidemiology should embrace planetary stewardship. So the commitment to take care of the planet as part of the role and mission of epidemiology. And then a related consequence of this is probably we need to include, to consider, to elaborate uh, this planetary stewardship within our ethical guidelines in epidemiology and in environmental epidemiology. Well, if you look to the paper in 2017 by Kramer and Solskjaer on the ethics guidelines in environmental epidemiology, there is only a couple of times where the climate change is cited even indirectly. And you have an opportunity to see in much more detail which may be the ways to elaborate ethical guidelines that we can incorporate to our practice in this paper, sorry for the mistake, is not the year 2000, is the year 2022 in the, in the Sam Myers and Howie Franking book in a chapter that is devoted to uh, ethics in planetary health. So I think that this gives some, uh, some, some ideas for uh, changing our, our way of thinking about human health and moving to a way of thinking about human health as part of the health of the planet. So the next type of challenges is the challenges of knowledge. And we can move to the next slide, please. 
And challenges of knowledge, I mean, uh, are, are crucial for, for uh, a planetary health approach to epidemiology. And I would like to think a bit about causality and the way we, we, we used to think about causality that is basically in a model in which human health is the outcome and the environment is the external variables. And then as we have seen in previous presentations, we consider the number of uh, confounders and, and, and mediators. And what planetary health approach is asking is to change this paradigm and to move to a paradigm in which human health is also a causal factor for the health of the planet. And then it means understanding the relationship not longer as a unidirectional relationship with all its complexities, but a bidirectional relationship. And this is because we know the health of the humans and the health of the planet are closely interrelated. And obviously this change, it means also a change in the level of complexity. And it's only moving from causal models in which we have a limited number of variables, despite we have seen in the previous presentation by Klaus that we can, we now may have the tools to elaborate uh, tens of thousands of uh, combinations of this limited number of variables to a models in which the complexity is uh, defined but by a large number of variables of humans, other living beings, and the natural systems. And for this, we need frameworks. And some of these frameworks are going to be socio-ecological frameworks or socio-ecological systems. In the next slide, you have one example of this uh, framework, socio-ecological framework. This is the, it's a, one of them, but it's a framework of the International Panel for Biodiversity in which you have, uh, uh, in, 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 the, in the bottom, you have uh, the nature with all the biodiversity and the ecosystems. You have also different colors, blues and greens. The greens are the Western science concepts and the blues are concepts that are very relevant for some uh, indigenous cultures or for other paradigms like Mother Earth in this case. And then in the top, you have the health and the quality of life. And you have the many different arrows linking the health of the nature and the health of the humans through the benefits of nature and through the different social, economical, and political, uh, and political drivers. And what is important here is that we need this type of frameworks to frame our causal models in epidemiology and also assuming that we are interested in human health as much as in the health of the planet. Obviously, this type of complex frameworks need complex methods. And this is the next slide, the importance of the complex methods, the methods for complexity. Uh, we have seen uh, 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 quite of this in the previous presentation and Alessandro and Klaus presentation on, on forecasting and scenarios. And, and uh, well, this is just to remind that during the last decades, it has been a growing interest in complex systems. And many of us have been moving to uh, using machine learning methods and system dynamics and agent-based methods. And I think that this is tremendously important in, this, in front of these challenges for epidemiology. Here, I just pick up two references. One, it was a very interesting paper by uh, Case and Serda, uh, uh, talking about uh, basically social epidemiology and attempts to model uh, epidemics like obesity and drug addiction uh, using uh, uh, systems models. And then a discussion from Miguel Hernan and Sandro Galea about how to interrelate these models with the uh, more canonical causal inference that we have seen in some of the previous presentation. I think that both using uh, uh, this framework for social ecosystems 
And uh, doing this with complex methods is one of the ways to, uh, to face these challenges uh, for epidemiology in the Anthropocene. Or in the next slide, I will uh, uh, move a bit about implementation. So what this means for the practice of epidemiology, and when I say the practice, I mean the practice in the context of public health, the type of health problems we deal with and the type of strategies that we try to put in system with policies and services and programs. And to do that, I, I, I would like to simplify the complexity with this two by two table interrelating human health and planet health and suggesting that there are four different possibilities. The more straightforward ones, the ones that are good and good for the health of the planet and the human health and the bad and bad, the ones that are bad for planet and bad for humans and the more complex ones, which are trade offs, uh, good for humans and bad for planet and the other way around. And for the, I mean, there is no time in this presentation, but uh, for good and good, the key concept is co-benefits. And I think that this again is a, uh, a fundamental concept. And it means that strategies that are good for the planet, like mitigation strategies are also good for the humans. And these co-benefits can, we have evidence that can be so large that probably the, we can we can with with uh, uh, with a strong background we can say that the that with all its tragedy the climate crisis and the crisis of the Anthropocene are at the same time providing a unique opportunity for the human public health because the magnitude of the potential co-benefits and you have example of sustainable cities sustainable uh, food systems, integrated land uses, etc. And the best example of bat and bat, it's probably the best is smoking, which is because it's one of the most devastating agricultural practices and also a devastating effects for the human health. But when you think about all these uh, type of uh, practices that interrelate the human health of the health of the planet, I mean, we also need to develop new implementation concepts. And in the context of prevention, I would say probably the more important ones are mitigation and adaptation. So we need increasingly to see mitigation prevention strategies in the context of mitigation and adaptation. Well, in these implementation challenges, there are a couple of things that are crucial. Uh, one is the future and the other one is the urgency. And the next one for the future, we already have seen this, the next slide in the presentation of Klaus. Uh, and I am just going to add that in the context of the challenges of the Anthropocene, there is an increasing number of uh, scenarios that are, uh, Klaus has been explaining very well what is the, the, the importance and the, and the limitation of the uh, scenarios. But some of these uh, scenarios have been developed uh, with uh, metrics uh, and are very useful in the context of these challenges. One example is that the so-called shared socioeconomic pathways, uh, they have been adopted in the last round of evaluations by the International Panel of Climate Change, and they are useful to translate uh, potential policies or even uh, uh, analysis of impact into these different scenarios, which involve economic determinants and political determinants and ideological determinants. Uh, and I think that in contrast to most of our efforts in the past, I mean, uh, modeling the future and modeling potential uh, policies and potential impacts, it's fundamental to face the challenges of the Anthropocene. And the other challenge is the urgency. And in the next slide, this challenge is, uh, is uh, schematized by this figure from the GEO6. GEO6 was the last report of United Nations for the state of the health of the planet. And basically what the figure says is most of our current policies in public health are between integrated policies at best or business as usual most of the time. 
And with this type of policies, you know well, it takes decades, not one decade, several decades, to have small gains in public health, reducing standards of pollution or changing legislation uh, for some of the risk and having some uh, modest and uh, slowly increasing public health benefits. But the fundamental problem in the context of the Anthropocene is that this time scale is totally inappropriate for the urgency of the challenge we have. And this is where it came this concept of transformative policies that most, uh, more and more people uh, agree on the need of these transformative policies. Nobody knows exactly what they mean. Uh, when you put them in place are frequently complex and create uh, difficult trade falls and political conflicts. But uh, what is obvious is that we need interventions in a scale of time that we are not used to do in the past. And I think this is another very important challenge. Well, I will finish with a couple of slides. The, the next one is just to, to make tribute to probably the more important pioneer of planetary health, Professor Tom Anthony McMichael. Uh, some of us, I, I, I'm sure I have some friends in, in, in the room. I cannot see you now from the screen, but I, I'm sure I have some friends and, and uh, probably with some of you have had the privilege of uh, having direct relationship with Tony McMichael. And he was, uh, uh, he did a big effort to, to make us aware of these challenges and probably we did not react uh, soon enough. Uh, but this is to make a challenge, to make tribute to his contribution. I, I have been reviewing carefully uh, many of the works of uh, uh, Professor Mike Michael uh, during the last years. And uh, surprisingly to me, he did not broad much about the direct consequences for epidemiology and epidemiological methods. But in this paper in 2013, he elaborated on some of the impediments we may have to face these challenges. And these are three impediments that uh, he was very bright in, in identifying. One is the lack of understanding of population health sensitivity to climate changes. I, I mean, we are lucky now to know more and more about this, in part thanks to the work of Tony. Now we are seeing that the last summer in Europe has produced uh, tens of thousands of excess deaths. Uh, in some countries like Spain, more than 10,000 in the summer. Uh, most of them in old people, and we are knowing more about this sensitivity to climate changes. But the other two are probably more pervasive. One is our tendency to choose research topics which are amenable to conventional epidemiology. And then it puts us in a vicious circle. We need to think this vicious circle, and we need to approach topics that are not conventional today for us. And obviously for this, we need support, training, funding. The other, the other one, and this is also very important, lack of interdisciplinary collaborative scenarios-based modeling. So and just, probably so, the type, so, so yeah. We, we, we have to... Uh, I finish with the next one. Yeah, great. I finish with, I finish with the next one, insisting in the importance of interdisciplinarity and saying, well, in the next one, we have the tools for this journey. And we have one compass. The compass is the SDGs. The SDGs is difficult to operationalize, but it's a compass for moving in this direction. And in the side figure, you have a figure coming from the Nobel Prize Foundation Summit, Our Health, Our Future, where it uh, very graphically says the main challenge for epidemiology in the future is to contribute to restore the development of our societies within the limits of the biosphere and addressing the health and social inequalities. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, we have uh, one minute left for the discussion, which is less uh, than uh, uh, 
uh, when uh, expected. So we will uh, not have the possibility to uh, take questions because I understand that uh, we really need to start the next uh, session uh, at uh, on time. Uh, of course, it's a pity, but I'm sure that uh, we will uh, able to take uh, this information that we got from these great presentations uh, and we have to digest a bit this information uh, uh, also and uh, I hope that they will be influential influential for our future work. Uh, so I would like to thank you and thank the speakers again and uh, if you want to say something to the Royce. Yeah, I switch another time to Italian to close the session. So, um, grazie a tutti per essere venuti. È stata una sessione veramente interessante. Spero eh, soprattutto per eh, chi si occupa di intelligenza artificiale in epidemiologia e anche in epidemiologia clinica. E, mh, niente, ringrazio tutti quanti ancora e diamo spazio alla prossima non sessione. Ora eh, non vedo. Dovrebbe esserci Carla un... ok, grazie.